The economic importance of trust between the U.S. and China cannot be understated. That is the view of Myron Brilliant. He is the executive vice president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce here in Washington, D.C. He told me that the relationship between the two cannot improve unless trust is assured. Two or three realities here. One is that there is a growing distrust, uh, broadly speaking, in the U.S.-China relationship, something that the two governments really have to work on. But it also filters down into the business community. It's why it's important that there be a strategic framework between China and the United States. It's why we support the bilateral investment treaty negotiations, to try to build up trust. Two, we've got to avoid a tit-for-tat response. So if the U.S. government is investigating or looking at a corporate investment from China and going through our CFIUS national security review process, we've got to be careful that, uh, on both sides that China doesn't then respond, okay, just because a company from China was denied an opportunity that therefore we're going to deny the next time the United States is looking to invest in a strategic market. Uh, so we've got to watch the tit-for-tat on both sides. Let's talk about getting it right. What does getting it right look like to you over the next couple of years? How will Congress, the White House, and the administration in China work together to earn that trust back from really both sides and restore sort of a more um, progressive working environment, if you will, to address these issues head on? Well, I know what, what we can't do. We can't try to isolate China. We need to engage China as a strategic partner on global issues. So that whether it's dealing with them in the context of the IMF or the World Trade Organization, the multilateral negotiations, China needs to be an active participant, for example, in the trade and service negotiations. China needs to also look at its own trade policies. It has to change from an export-oriented model to a more consumer-based model, which would allow, if there's more consumption going on in China domestically, that's going to allow for more trade. It also has to release some of the pressures around the strategic pillars of the society. And that means taking on the state-owned enterprise issues. It means leveling the playing field for foreign investors. It means creating national treatment for U.S. companies and other foreign investors in the market. So there's a lot that China needs to do. Our economic relationship is growing. As I said, it's over $500 billion today. Uh, but uh, if it's going to continue to grow, if it's going to not only grow substantially, but grow in productive ways that are going to showcase the win-win scenarios, collaboration around energy and environmental issues, collaboration around health care and on pharmaceutical issues, on IT, then I think both sides are going to have to work and double down, so to speak, on this relationship. Too critical for the world that the United States-China relations do not improve. Speaking of progress, there are two major issues now facing the U.S. and China on an economic front. One is the bilateral investment treaty. Recently, this past summer, discussions are going to continue on, and they're going to move forward with those discussions. How do you think those discussions will go, and what's needed to complete those discussions in a meaningful way that both sides can walk away and say, this is a good deal? On the issue of the bilateral investment treaty, the U.S. Chamber is strongly an advocate that China and the United States have a bilateral investment treaty. Uh, and the reason is, one, it would provide more security in terms of investments in our country at, from China, but also our investments clearly in China. Uh, it would allow for investor protections. Two, it will address some of the market access concerns we have. It will level the playing field. We want to see national treatment for our, foreign, uh, for our investment in China, which has been an issue. How do we get treated versus, say, state-owned enterprises? So we'll have to address uh, the issue of state-owned enterprises in these discussions. Difficult issues. But if you step back, what's the, what's the game, end game here? We want to have a more productive, healthier economic relationship between the two countries. There are lots of regulatory issues. There are issues around intellectual property. There is market access issues. And at the end of the day, we'd like to even see a free trade agreement between China and the United States. But a first step has to be the bilateral investment treaty. And we made progress. The two governments made progress this year in looking at the terms and conditions by which this negotiation will take place, looking at a negative list. In other words, you say everything's in unless it's explicitly excluded. Now, China has a long negative list. We'd like to see them shrink it down. But we're actually reasonably optimistic that negotiations next year will pick up steam. Not sure it will get completed in 2014, but I think it's at least uh, moving in the right direction, and there seems to be real energy behind it, both in the United States and China. Would China be, I guess for lack of a better word, included in a possible discussion to be included in the Trans-Pacific Partnership? 
it makes sense for China to study it. But China has to understand if they want to join TPP negotiations, they've got to agree to these high standards. They've got to have the same set of ambition in terms of a comprehensive trade negotiation. And so we'll see how serious the China is about joining.